Hey guys, welcome back to another video. I figured that this channel is going to need some variety besides just the Mega Man Marathon, since if I don't, you guys will be only getting Mega Man for the next year, and that's not amazingly appealing to both you or me. I recently happened to run into a YouTuber by the name of John Stone while looking for some Pokemon reviews, and I was intrigued by the idea of the Professor Oak's challenge. I watched both his Red and Blue and his Gold and Silver challenges, and I was immediately hooked. They're so time-consuming, but rewarding at the same time. So I figured I'd jump on the bandwagon. Since he decided to do the original games, I'm going to take on the remix, just to see how much harder they are in comparison to their original counterparts. Let's see how easily we can complete Professor Oak's challenge in Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. Before we get into this challenge, if you haven't watched John's videos about it, I highly suggest doing so in order to get context on if this game is a harder one to complete when in comparison to the original Red and Blue. Also, I'd like to state the rules, as there are quite a few here. Number 1. You must complete the Pokedex as much as possible before being allowed to collect a gym badge. This means that we have to evolve Pokemon as much as possible before a gym, meaning we have to evolve stuff like our starter into the final evolution and Pidgey to Pidgeot before Brock. This is the basis for the challenge and is what makes the challenge take a crazy long amount of time, but we'll get to that in due time. Rule number two is that only one game can be used, meaning we can't trade over everything as soon as we enable trading, or else that would nullify the need of this challenge. Also, this means we can't get trade evolutions during the run, so no Alakazam, Machamp, Gengar, Golem, Politoed, Porygon 2, Kingdra, Steelix, Slowking, and Scizor. We also won't be able to obtain Pokemon that were affected by the day and night cycle from the previous generation, so we won't be able to get Espeon and Umbreon, though we'll be able to breed Eevee in the post-game for the other evolutions. Lastly, rule number three is that we can't use glitches, or else that would be cheating. Just like trading over the whole living decks for rule one, it just breaks the challenge and makes it no fun. Other than that, it's just like any other regular old game of Pokemon. So I decided to use Fire Red for this run out of personal preference, since Fire Red was the first Pokemon game I actually ever owned, having received it as a gift when I turned four years old. As young as I was, I had no idea what was going on, but I was able to beat the game within a few months of playing it, eventually growing to the point where I understood the process of training up an actual team. But that's beside the point. Maybe I'll get into that if I decide to do an all-inclusive Pokemon marathon who knows how many years down the line. <laughs> Getting back on track, there's a few differences between Fire Red and Leaf Green that I'll address once we get to those certain parts, such as exclusive Pokemon that we won't be able to obtain due to being allowed only one game during the challenge. Anyway, I start a new game and made myself chaotic, since Meatball won't fit without only one L and looking stupid. I name my rival Gary, which really clashes when I battle him since the word RIVAL is in all caps as if it's getting shouted to you, saying RIVAL GARY! I get to the lab and choose my starter Pokemon. This is the first important choice of the game, seeing as you have to choose your starter and evolve it all in the same section. Always choose the starter that has the lowest level of evolution, since Charizard and Blastoise both get to level 36 before they evolve, I choose Bulbasaur since it evolves into Venusaur at level 32. Four levels may not sound like much to you, but early game, especially when the highest level Pokemon we can fight in the wild is level 6. There's also a 9400 XP gap between level 32 and 36, and you're not getting more than around 75 per wild battle, and that's at the maximum. So that's around an extra 1200 battles that you'll be needing to fight to get them. So let's just go with Bulbasaur. After we beat our rival, we go to pick up Oak's parcel and get the Pokedex, allowing for the challenge to truly begin, giving us Bulbasaur to the total. <laughs> I immediately travel to Route 1 after getting some Pokeballs from the Professor himself, and I catch a Pidgey and a Rattata, bringing our total up to 3 Pokemon. I then travel to Route 21 and catch a Spearow and a Mankey within about 3 minutes. I also decide to catch an additional Spearow for trade later on in the game. I decide to grind for a bit and get Bulbasaur to level 11 before challenging my rival again for some more money to pick up some more Pokeballs. I travel to Route 2 and go to Viridian Forest, catching Weedle, Caterpie, and Pikachu. I found Pikachu during grinding for Bulbasaur, saving me some time since it's a waste of time just to keep running. I decide to grind Bulbasaur up to level 16, where it evolves into Ivysaur, taking about 40 minutes after catching Pikachu, adding another to the dex total. I decide to go a little random after training to Ivysaur, getting some experience to Spearow and revolving Pidgey at level 18 into Pidgeotto. 
Somehow, near the beginning of the grind, I caught a shiny Pidgey, which was actually pretty shocking when it happened. I had a feeling that due to all of the wild grinding I was going to be doing, I would at least have a remote chance of encountering one of them, but I didn't expect it this early on in the game. I catch it as a prize, bringing the shiny counter to one. I'm gonna make a bet by the end of this series of Professor Oak challenges that I'll have 20 shiny Pokemon. Mark my words. This grind also took me about an hour and 20 minutes, but the pain has not begun yet, trust me, it will soon. Now that I have Pidgeotto, I decide to take it through the five trainers in Viridian Forest in order to gain about a level and a half on it. From here, it's all wild battles. And this is where the slog begins, since I did about 20 hours of wild battles to get the rest of the Pokemon needed for this section. After I fought the trainers, I switched back over to Ivysaur and grinded for about five and a half hours before getting to Venusaur at level 32. This is the second hardest Pokemon to evolve in this section, but it really didn't feel all that bad. I could get used to doing these challenges a bit more often. I say that while I still have a few others to go that take me quite a bit of time. Next up I go for Spiro, which only took me about 2 hours to evolve into Fero, seeing as it only had to get to level 20 before evolving. Mankey was next, and I think he was the hardest Pokemon to evolve during this section. Mostly everything in Viridian Forest resists his best moves at this point, those being Low Kick at level 6 and Karate Chop at level 11. The only one that doesn't is Pikachu, and he has the ability Static that paralyzes you practically every time you attack him, so I just decided to grind on Route 2 on Weak Rattata and Pidgey. I decided to take out the last trainer of this section in Brock's Gym when Mankey got to level 14 so that I could easily take them down, netting me a bit more XP and money. Overall, it took me about four and a half hours just to get him to Primeape at level 28. Unfortunately, we still have a few more to get. Procrastination gets the better of me, so I skip out on Pidgeot for now and go ahead and take out Weedle, evolving him to Kakuna at level 7, and then Beedrill at level 10. This only took me about an hour, and so did Caterpie, as it mirrors Weedle by evolving into Metapod at level 7, and then Butterfree at level 10. This leaves only Pidgeot and Raticate left, since we can't do anything with Pikachu until we get a Thunderstone. I decided to do the harder one first, evolving Pidgeotto into Pidgeot at level 36. This took me about 8 hours, which sounds surprising since Ivysaur to Venusaur only took me 5.5. This is proof of the 4 level difference, and if I had chosen Squirtle or Charmander, I would have taken another 2.5 hours just to evolve them into Blastoise or Charizard respectively. Lastly, I level Raditz at level 20 and get Raticate. This allows us to take on Brock, and I beat him with a time of 23 hours and 28 minutes. Barely any of this was idling, and I took about two hours of it just walking to the Pokemon Center and growing back to my grinding spot. Fortunately, the beginning is the biggest slog of any Professor Oak's challenge, so it goes up from here in the next section. Next up is Route 3. I avoided as many trainers here as possible before I got to the grass, where I go ahead and catch Nidoran male, Jigglypuff, and Nidoran female. It literally took me around 25 minutes to find the female Nidoran due to the 1% encounter rate. And there's quite a few of those in the game, and they'll range from accidentally encountering before something that's 20% of the time, or taking 45 minutes before getting one. After that irritation, I run up to the Pokemon Center outside of Mount Moon and buy the Magic Cup for 500 Poke Dollars. I go through the trainers and switch train Magikarp, including Mount Moon itself, grabbing Zubat, Geodude, Paris, and Clefairy in the process. Also, if we collect a TM for Thief here in Mount Moon, we can use that to attack other wild Clefairy to see if they have Moonstones. We do this on two of them in order to get Moonstones for all four evolutions that we'll need, as we also collect two along the way. It took me about an hour to find these, which isn't terrible, but it definitely could be better. I go back and immediately start switch training Magikarp, since he's the most incompetent Pokemon in the entire game, since we have to take him from level 5 to level 15 without an attacking move. Luckily it isn't too hard, and I'm able to take out all the trainers on Route 3 and in Mount Moon to get Magikarp to level 13 in the process. At the end of Mount Moon, I grab the Helix Fossil so that I could revive Ammonite much later on leaving the Kabuto line to be unobtainable in this playthrough. 
I get to Route 4 and skip out on Mega Punch and Mega Kick since they're not very useful. I go ahead and capture an Ekans on this route, bringing our Pokedex total up to 28 Pokemon. Because this is a Fire Red run, we won't be able to obtain Sandshrew or Sandslash for this playthrough. After arriving in Cerulean City, I immediately heal and go to the gym trainers for their good experience and money, then travel to Nugget Bridge, where Magikarp gets even closer to evolving. I take a break from Switch training and I capture an Oddish and two Abra, one to evolve and one to trade later on. Bellsprout is the Leaf Green exclusive in place of Oddish, so I won't be able to get his line for this playthrough. I luckily captured a level 10 Abra, allowing me to only have to grind for 6 levels, saving me a small amount of grind time. I switch train through the rest of routes 24 and 25, getting Magikarp to level 18. I return to the Pokemon Center in Cerulean City and use 2 Moonstones to evolve Clefairy into Clefable, and Jigglypuff into Wigglytuff, adding 2 more to the dex total. I grab Geodude, Machop, and the Nidorans and head south facing the Team Rocket Grunt that stole TM26 dig from the hiker. After arriving in Route 5, I'm able to catch myself a Meowth, raising the total yet again. This leads me to Route 6, where I don't catch anything, but I do have quite a few trainers to take down. During these trainers, I got Magikarp to level 20, and it evolved into Gyarados. When I arrived in Vermilion City, I figured it would be a smart idea to organize my PC boxes, so I moved all fully evolved Pokemon away so that I knew that I wouldn't have to touch them for the rest of the main game. A few of them I'll have to breed in the after game, but we have quite a bit of time before I have to worry about that. After grabbing my spare Spearow, I grab the old rod right next to the Pokemon Center, as well as trading said Spearow for a Farfetch'd in the house next to the Pokemon Fan Club. This is the only way to receive a Farfetch'd in the game. And the name Chiding is one of the worst things I've ever seen. At least red, blue, and yellow have the dignity to call him ducks. I enter the Pokemon fan club next to get the bike voucher from the president, and totally forget about it since I never really used the bike in Pokemon games. I grab my Primeape and go east to Diglett's cave. I manage to capture myself a Diglett, and Primeape comes in handy so that I can change Doug Trio's encounter rate from 5% to 100% with relative ease thanks to repels. This reduces the amount of grinding we'll have to do by quite a bit. Traveling back to Route 2 allows us to take the spare Abra in my possession and trade it for a Mr. Mime. This is the only way to receive a Mr. Mime in the game, and I don't know why, but this game seems to have an affinity for trade-only Pokemon. Returning back to Route 11, I catch Drowsy and switch train my remaining Abra to level 16 in order to get a Kadabra. Since there's no trading, I won't be able to obtain an Alakazam. This brings us up to a total of 40 Pokemon. Not bad for only one badge, but it gets much better, trust me. I sub out for a few other Pokemon I have to evolve on board the SSN, taking down all of the available trainers within about 30 minutes, evolving Nidoran male into Nidorino, and Nidoran female into Nidorina. We get to take on a rival again before we get access to the captain, and he's relatively easy with our level 37 Venusaur on our side. Defeating him grants us the access to the first hidden machine of the game, Cut. The SSN leaves as we evolve Nidorina and Nidorino into Nido Queen and Nido King, respectively. Now it's grind time. First up is Paris. After about an hour and 15 minutes of grinding on Route 11 in Diglett's Cave, Paris evolves at level 24 into Parasect. This is actually easier than grinding in Generation 1 since Paris gets Leech Life at level 19 rather than level 20. Neat. Going back to heal and substituting Parasect for Oddish, and this is where I realize I have the VS Seeker, since I normally never use it. I move over to Route 6 and used it to grind Zubat, getting him to level 22 after about an hour so that she can evolve into Golbat. Crobat isn't available for the post game, so we're going to leave her as is for the time being. Moving on to Oddish, I'm able to raise her in about an hour inside of Jiglet's cave in order to get Gloom. Vileplume will come up soon, and Blossom isn't obtainable until the postgame, so we'll catch another Gloom sometime in the future for that purpose, rather than grinding another one up now. Ekans takes over from here, evolving in about an hour and a half into Arbok, and then Geodude evolves into Graveler at level 25 in about an hour, bringing us up to 49 Pokemon. We won't need to obtain Golem in this playthrough due to it needing a trade. 
This leaves us with the two most difficult Pokemon of the section, Drowsy and Meowth, which really aren't all that bad, actually. These two take a combined three hours to evolve, level 26 for Hypno and level 28 for Persian. And with a total of 51 Pokemon, we can take down Misty. With this, we have 35 hours and 42 minutes on the clock and we are ready to take down the next section, which is probably the largest one outside of the after game, so let's get going. After being able to use Cut, I pull up my Raticate for an HM Slave and fight off some mandatory trainers on Route 9 before being able to catch a Voltorb on Route 10. I grabbed the Eversone on an accident from the A in the Rock Tunnel Pokemon Center and realized I never picked up Flash before heading this way. I go into Rock Tunnel anyway just so I can catch everything that I need before going back. This allows me to capture Machop and Onix. After finding those two, I head back to Route 9 to train Voltorb on the trainers I skipped, and going all the way back to Route 2, I grab Flash for ease, along with the old Amber so I don't forget to revive it into Aerodactyl later on in the run. Trekking all the way back to Rock Tunnel allows me to use Flash and take some time to train Voltorb against the various trainers. I battle so many trainers in Wild Pokemon that Voltorb starts to use Struggle, barely surviving the whole tunnel before emerging at level 27. I immediately dart to the Lavender Town Pokemon Center, avoiding the trainers on the southern part of Route 10 so I can primarily take them down with a fully healed Voltorb. It weren't enough to finish leveling it, so I fought a few trainers on Route 8 to the west of Lavender, including one of the retroactively added double battles, and I finally get Voltorb to Electrode at level 30. After leveling the Machop I have in my party for a little while, I take a slight detour to the patch of grass, finding myself a Growlithe. I finish off the trainers for this route, head to Celadon City, and pick up the Eevee from the back of the building where we get the T to get into Saffron City. This allows us to add Eevee to the dex total. We'll breed this in the after game to get the other evolutions. Unfortunately, as I said, we won't be able to get Espeon or Umbreon due to the lack of the day and the night cycle. I immediately travel to the Celadon department store where we can handle quite a few of the stone evolutions we've gotten along the way. I evolve Gloom into Vileplume, Pikachu into Raichu, Growlithe into Arcanine, and Eevee into Vaporeon. After having finished the easiest batch of Pokemon to obtain in this run, I deposit them and carry on to the cafe, where I am able to get the coin case. And this is where this section quickly becomes a disaster. I'm at least able to get 290 coins from the floor and random NPCs, so I immediately blow all of my money so I can get up to around 5,000 coins. I get desperate, so I go to the Celadon Mart and sell everything I can, netting me about another 7,000 Poké Dollars, netting me only another 350 coins. I take my luck to the slots, and get a few jackpots after some saves coming, getting up to about 6,800 coins. I grab Scyther, since it was cheap enough, and Dratini, since it's the only Pokémon I have to train out in the Game Corner group. Yeah, we're gonna have to evolve that thing from level 18 to level 55. It takes a ton of experience to get up to that point because of how the Dratini family is in the slow experience group, so it's going to need about 201,000 XP to evolve fully. I infiltrate the Rocket Game Corner hideout so that I can get some more money, as well as level up Machop before the hulking mammoth of Dratini takes over everything, evolving it into the choke at level 28. We won't be able to get Machamp due to it being a trade evolution. I'm able to get Dratini to level 20 when I take down Giovanni, who hands over the Sylph Scope when he leaves. This allows us to go to the Pokemon Tower in Lavender Town, but before we do that, I stop and deliver the tea to the guards to get in Saffron City, and immediately sell more things to get more coins to our possession. Then I think about it and I'm like, you know what, let's just go get more money in Pokemon and worry about it at the end of the section. Then I went to the fighting dojo and laid waste to everything in the room with my Dratini and Venusaur, then he made a bit of extra money and a Hitmonlee for compensation. We can't get Hitmonchan due to us only getting the option of one or the other, but we'll be able to breed for one when we get to the after game. I finally arrive in the Pokemon Tower, only to be interrupted by my rival. Dratini finally was able to hold its own in this fight, allowing him to gain two whole levels, including the sixth strat where I paralyzed the Kadabra, it synchronized paralyzed my Dratini, and Shed Skin cured me immediately. It's the little things that make me happy in a Pokemon game. After his obliteration, I can catch Ghastly, Cubone, and Haunter, giving us three more to add to the dex total. Gengar is unobtainable due to needing a trading partner. 
Unfortunately, the Marowak we fight after uncovering it, but the Sylph Scope isn't catchable, so I'll have to grind Cubone later on. I managed to fight off the Rocket members at the top, finally bringing Dratini to level 30 and evolving into Dragonair. Bringing Mr. Fuji back down to his home allows us to get the Poke Flute, giving us access down to Fuchsia City. However, we don't go that way yet since I want to take down the Sylph Company before then so I can continue to level up Dragonair. I go there and take out every single trainer in the area, including my rival, which gets my Dragonair to level 42. Before we get to Giovanni, I talk to this guy here and he gives me a free Lapras. I usually use this on my team casually, so I never forget to pick it up. Lastly, we've got another fight against Giovanni, and I pick up the Master Ball after defeating him. This is going to be used way down the line, since there's a certain Pokemon that does not like being captured, and you probably know which one it is. After finishing up with the Rockets, I went west past Celadon and captured the Static Snorlax, adding another to the deck's total. This is where I realized I didn't have the bicycle, so I went back to Cerulean, picked it up, and went all the way back so I can go through Cycling Road. I fought all of the trainers I could until I found some grass, where I captured Doduo. I managed to make it to Fuchsia City and travel to the Safari Zone, where we have quite a decent time, actually. Seeing as there's quite a number of extremely rare encounters, I somehow make it in three trips, managing to capture Rhyhorn, Venonat, Execute, Kangaskhan, Chansey, and Tauros, along with getting the Gold Teeth and the Surf HM. I go to organize my boxes and I evolve, execute, and an Executor in the meantime. I also pick up the Good Rod, allowing me to pick up Goldeen and two Poliwags. I got two of them so I could evolve the second into a Poliwhirl for a later trade. After finishing the last few trainers on Cycling Road in Route 18, I picked up the experience share from the aid in the eastern exit of Fuchsia City. It's not as useful as it gets in Generation 6 and 7, but it is helpful since I don't have to waste time switching whenever I need to switch train. While I'm grinding on the trainers in Routes 15 and 14, I pick up another Gloom for Evolution in the aftergame. I also managed to catch a Ditto during this time as well. After a few more trainers on Route 14, I got lazy and used 6 rare candies to jump Dragonair from level 49 to level 55, finally giving me a Dragonite. Dragonite is great for tearing through the rest of the game, so we shouldn't have any trouble with any more battles. I make my way up through Silence Bridge and finally get the Super Rod. I use this to capture a horsey. And this is where I realized that my recording corrupted all the way up through the Pokemon Mansion of Cinnabar Island. So I'm going to have to use screenshots and other footage we recorded. Ugh. I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen with Heart Gold. Did I say I'm doing Heart Gold? Also, ugh. In summary, I continued to use the Super Rod to capture Seedra on Route 19 and two Psyduck on Route 12. I evolved both of them within about 45 minutes, since they were only a few levels away from evolving, one of which was used to trade for a Lickitung, which is exclusive to trading in this game. I switch over to the Good Rod and capture a Krabby on Route 12. It took around 45 minutes to evolve since I made sure to capture one at level 15, giving me a Kingler at level 28. Lastly, I travel all the way back to Pallet Town to capture a Shelter, allowing me to use a Water Stone to evolve into Cloister. That's all I had to capture for this section, so I did some grinding to evolve Goldeen to Sea King at level 33, both my Poliwax into Poliwhirls at level 25, one of them traded for a Jinx, and I used the Water Stone on the other to get Poliwrath. The most annoying Pokemon to evolve in this section is Rhyhorn, since it took about two hours after all the trainers I took down along the way to get to level 42, giving me a Rhydon. I finally managed to get enough money to get Porygon from the game corner, this is all the Pokemon we can catch in this section, so I go after Koga so I can use Surf and go towards Cinnabar Island. I go south and catch Tentacool at level 33, allowing me to get Tentacool in one level, making it the easiest level up evolution I'm ever going to do. I continue onward and arrive in the Seafoam Islands. While I can't catch Articuno at this time since I don't have the ability to use Strength outside of battle, I can capture a Seal and a Dugong, adding another two Pokemon to the total. I traveled all the way back to Pallet Town and surfed to Route 21, stopping immediately to catch Tangela. The last Pokemon I captured with corrupted footage was Coughing, Wheezing, and Grimer. 
Afterwards, I revived the fossils Ominite and Aerodactyl, giving me yet another two Pokemon. Ammonite starts at level 5, but grows quickly, so it wasn't too much of a pain to raise. After getting the secret key from the end of the Pokemon Mansion, I had only one area left for this section, the Power Plant. I captured Magnemite, Magneton, and the Fire Red exclusive Electabuzz. This only left me with one threat, Zapdos. After about only 5 minutes of chucking Ultra Balls, I catch it, which was much quicker than I thought. I really thought I would have to reset at least once on each bird, but I was glad for the time save. I try to exit the power plant after excavating for other items, and I find yet another shiny, this time being a Voltorb, bringing our shiny total up to two. I'm telling you, by the time we get to Sword and Shield, I'm gonna have 20 shinies from the wild. Lastly, I grind the only two Pokemon of this section, evolving Ammonite into Amistar at level 40, and evolving Grimer into Muck at level 38, which only took about two hours. Overall, this section in its entirety only took about four and a half hours, making for the shortest section yet, but not even the shortest in the game. I go back to fight Erika in Celadon City, since it gives me access to Articuno, because I can use strength outside of battle. Articuno is literally the only Pokemon of this section. This fight goes even easier than Zapdos, going in with only about three Ultra Balls which leaves me to fight Blaine. Yep, that's it. The section literally only took me about an hour. And it could have been shorter, since I had to run around the region to enter from the Fuchsia City side of the Seafoam Islands, and I didn't even know the layout of the caves that well, so it really should have been better. And now you may be wondering, wow, so I guess it's time to go take down to the rest of the gym leaders and get to Victory Road to catch Moltres, huh? Well, no. The remakes add several areas in the form of the Sevi Islands, which are seven islands that we can access to capture Pokemon outside of the Kanto decks. We have access to only the first three islands until the after game. Since we only have the Kanto decks, it really wouldn't make much sense to derail that until then. There's a quest that we have to complete before being able to go back to the mainland, seeing as we need to deliver a meteorite for Celio. We do that, and capture three additional Pokemon in this section. Ponyton Rapidash are available in Kindle Road, and the last of the legendary birds, Moltres, is catchable on Mount Ember. Moltres gave me the most trouble out of the three birds, but nothing I really couldn't handle, since I still didn't have to reset to capture it, which was nice. Magmar is exclusive to Leaf Green here, so I don't get to catch it. Don't forget to grab HM06 Rock Smash from the Old Man in the Hot Spring before continuing. After this, we're able to go back to the mainland, and we wipe out the remaining major battles within about 35 minutes, taking down to Lieutenant Surge, Sabrina, Giovanni, my rival, Victory Road, Lorelei, Bruno, Agatha, and Lance. Lastly, we have our rival again, the Champion. After striking down his Charizard with a Zapdos 13 levels below it, we're able to join the Hall of Fame, allowing us to complete the game with a time of 59 hours and 51 minutes. However, this isn't quite the end of the game, since we still have a bit more to do, other than the ultimate fight with Mewtwo, of course. From here, we have some add-on story to complete, but we'll catch everything we need as we go. Firstly, Professor Oak gives us the national decks if we've captured over 60 Pokemon. We're over double that number, so we're raring to go. I travel back to Vermilion City so I can go back to One Island. I talk to Celio again so I can gain access to the quest to getting the Ruby and the Sapphire, but that'll be a bit later. From here, we were able to go to a different part of Ruby Path that was blocked up by rocket runs during the main quest, allowing us to capture Slugma and Mac Cargo. During my search for Mac Cargo, I managed to evolve my Golbat into Crobat, adding another to the total. After this, I deliver the Ruby to Celio and travel to Four Island, where breeding becomes available. I spend a few hours here, since I'm able to capture Wooper for Fire Red or Meryl for Leaf Green. Having Meryl available in Leaf Green makes it so that you can capture one additional Pokemon than Fire Red, as you're able to breed for Azuril and evolve into Azumarill, but I digress. I go ahead and handle a boatload of breeding here, catching Cleffa, Pichu, Igglybuff, Elekid, Smoochum, two Eevee, and two Tyrogue. I evolve the Eevees into Flareon and Jolteon with the Firestone and Thunderstone respectively, and evolve Tyrogue using vitamins to get Hitmontop and Hitmonchan, adding a staggering 9 Pokemon to the decks. 
While I did the boatload of walking to receive and hatch the eggs, I was able to evolve my Chansey into Blissey and Wooper into Quagsire inside of Icefall Cave. I made sure I grabbed HMO7 Waterfall and handled the events with Lorelei, afterwards catching Swinub and Delibird. Sneasel is the opposite version exclusive to Delibird, so it's not available in this playthrough. That ends our need for 4 Island until later, so I travel to 5 Island and capture Centret on Water Path. Quillfish is available here as well with the Super Rod in Fire Red, whereas Remoraid is available in Leaf Green, making Octillery also version exclusive. My Centret evolved into Furret after one battle, adding yet another to the total. I also managed to get Swine up to Piloswine at level 33. The dotted hole is the next place we need to go, so I try to get the Sapphire for Celio, but this random scientist blocks me, requiring me to go back to Five Island and take it from him and ultimately Team Rocket. Before going there, I do my catching for Ruin Valley, getting Natu, Yanma, and Wadafet. Heading to Pattern Bush, I manage to catch Spinarak, Heracross, and Ladybug. Before leaving, I manage to evolve Natu into Zatu. I travel back to the Pokemon Center to use the Sunstone I picked up on Gloom to evolve into Blossom. Now we can finally go back to Five Island. I decided to surf to the left of the island and catch myself a Hoppip so I can train it in the trainer battles ahead. During my utter destruction of the rocket grunts on Five Island, I evolved Spinarak into Ariados at level 22, Hoppip into Skiploom at level 18, and Skiploom into Jumpluff at level 27. And after defeating the scientist that stole the sapphire earlier, I am able to surf north of the main island and take a detour to the left to talk to an old man that gives me an egg. I hatch this into a Togepi. Going back on the main path, I challenge a couple of trainers, allowing me to evolve Ladybug into a Ladian at level 18. Continuing to the right leads me to the Lost Cave, where I am able to capture Murkrow. If you're playing Leaf Green, you'll be able to capture Mistrevis instead here. I go back to one island and give the Sapphire to Celia, giving us access to trading with Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. Good thing we don't have to do that, or else we'd be here for a few more hours trying to get a living dex. And lord knows I've already spent quite a bit of time on this challenge. Speaking of spending an ungodly amount of time on this challenge, I decided it was a good idea to go back to the mainland and capture a roaming legendary. In Fire Red and Leaf Green, you're able to capture one of the legendary beasts. Entei if you pick Bulbasaur, Raikou if you pick Squirtle, and Suicune if you pick Charmander. So two out of those three are automatically unobtainable, and thank god. So with 40 max repels in hand, I spent literally an hour just using them, changing areas if it didn't appear for the duration of the repel, coming back, rinse and repeat. I'm finally able to get Entei to appear, and since it'll run away if I end up not catching it on this turn, I use my Master Ball in order to give us an easy victory. We're going to be giving up the privilege to use it on Mewtwo, but he'll at least be manageable enough to use with Ultra Balls. Entei is the last Pokemon we have on the mainland other than Mewtwo, so I return to the Sevi Islands and breed the Wobbuffet I caught earlier, holding the Lax Incense so that I could breed for a Why Not. This is funnily enough the only Pokemon introduced in Generation 3 that you can catch in Fire Red without trading from an actual Hoenn game. One that I forgot to grab near the beginning of this section was Dunsparce on 3 Island, so I made sure to grab that before heading to 7 Island. Now before you say, oh you could have grabbed that before the Elite Four, no. The path that led me to get to the Dunsparce patch of grass was blocked off until I got through the Elite Four, so we're still safe here. Finally, we travel to Seven Island, the final island of the game, so let's take it down quickly. Firstly, I travel north and fight one trainer, leading my Togepi to evolve into Togetic. I suppose my friendship was increased by quite a bit after walking it during the Why Not hatching, so it made it easy to evolve. Going north into the canyon entrance, Fanpy is an available Pokemon to capture, adding one more to our total. Moving on into the canyon, 
I managed to capture Larvitar, and I evolved Fanpy into Donphan while searching for my last encounter for this area, Skarmory. At the end of the canyon, there's a cave with a really cool strength puzzle that took me a couple of tries to finish, but this unlocks caves later on in the area that contain one singular Pokemon we'll need. Before we get there, however, Larvitar evolved into Pupitar at level 30. We arrive in the Tenobi Chambers and we catch one form of unknown. Luckily, we only need one, since if we needed the other 27, I'd probably be headbutting the wall in distress. Wait, Slowpoke is going to have to headbutt trees in the next game? Well, at least it understands my pain. This is the last catch of the Sevi Islands, meaning all we have to do is grind Pupitar into Tyranitar. This only took an hour to get Tyranitar up to level 55, due to the high levels in the Cerulean Cave. That leaves me with only one Pokémon left to capture, Mewtwo. Yeah, if I didn't have to go through the darn cave first, that thing took me an hour to get through because I was lazy and didn't want to look up a walkthrough for it. After that exhausting trudge, I was able to get into the battle with Mewtwo. And this is a pretty intense battle, since Mewtwo has recover and can undo every little bit of damage you do to it, which is extremely frustrating when you're only doing about a third of its life bar with Dragon Claw, with a Dragonite that's literally two levels above it. Luckily I had Thunder Wave on my Dragonite, so it made it a little less likely to use Recover, but it still did require a reset for me to finally capture it. And with that, we are done. Or we would be if we didn't have one more challenge in front of us. The Elite Four is standing tall once again with even more powerful and new Pokémon for us to take down. I take my Dragonite, Mewtwo, Tyranitar, Entei, Zapdos, and Articuno into the fights, and managed to take down Lorelei, Bruno, Agatha, Lance, and my rival once again. And with a final crunch to his Alakazam, he goes down, and I lay claim to my final victory, entering the Hall of Fame with a final time of 72 hours and 38 minutes. And this challenge was a doozy, let me tell you. I had a lot of fun with it and literally spent the bulk of five days just grinding through it just to get this video out to you guys. I loved every second of it and hope you did as well. I'm going to be promising you guys heart gold next time, but I'm probably going to be splitting it into two parts due to the fact that the game is extremely long, and chances are if I didn't, it would be an hour and a half video and you guys wouldn't get it for about three months. But if you want this series to go past this and heart gold, let me know in the comments if you like that, because I'm really liking these challenges and they're a good time sink. Also, if you like this video, go ahead and check out my main series. I'm doing the all-inclusive Mega Man Marathon, where I'm taking a dedicated look at every Mega Man game in the franchise and seeing how they stack up today. Also, if you guys are interested in this challenge, I'll be leaving the links to the Discord server, as well as the Reddit page that I found this on, and I will be leaving my guide that I made for this in the description as well. Last thing I want to say is that I have a Patreon page. I've left a link for that in the description, and I hope you guys check it out, since I'd appreciate some money so that I can feed myself so that I can make videos, because I can't make videos if I'm dead. I'm just kidding. No, I'll mostly be using it to put back into the channel, since I'd like to be able to get capture cards and equipment that'll be able to give you authentic footage, rather than me having to scream at an emulator the whole time. And with that, you guys take care of yourselves, and I'll see you on Wednesday for Mega Man 4.